Good. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for attending this 2022 bike trip orientation. Uh, Sarah has her belt bike, but I mean, I didn't get the invite. Thanks a lot. Um, <laughs> Sarah has her bike trip helmet on and her, Scott and Sarah both have their <laughs> matching day glow vests to keep them safe. And it seems Brent even got in on the color coordination with the green and black. So maybe I got the memo. No, but you did get the memo because we know how much you like to wear comfortable black clothing. Yeah. On the trip. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> you're right. I am actually wearing my bike trip garb. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's great. For all of you uh, out there, webinars are super weird to present on. Um, it's like talking into the void. So um, th thanks for bearing with us on that. Um, I'm Tammy, the Lower Adolescent Program Director, joined with Sarah Hansen, um, our ninth grade math guide and also advisor extraordinaire. Same with Scott Elsa Laban, who is our seventh and eighth grade advisor and uh, occupations guide both forestry and urban farming. And Brent is our outdoor education coordinator at Great River School and kind of spans the distance between first through 12th grade and helps us make sure we get it all together. So um, you may have heard from Brent, if you have an upper elementary student recently who you all just got back from your trip to Long Lake. So, um, the purpose of this talk is to really orient, answer some questions, give you guys some ideas of what your student can expect on the bike trip this coming June, third through eighth or fourth through ninth, depending on which trip you're in. So all sorts of information are about to come at you. We're recording this. Um, presentation so it will be sent out with to you tomorrow um, to sort of remind and give you feedback if need be. So um, I will send it over to Sarah and um, I'll make it so that you can, if I can figure it out, here we go. Oh my gosh, who can share? All panelists. Zoom is hard when we don't do it anymore. Um, We're learning every day. Like, every day. It's always a humbling experience. It is. Um, <laughs> Sarah's sharing screen and we will send out this PowerPoint as well. There are several links embedded, so um, you'll be able to go from there. And without further ado, Scott, Sarah, and Brent. Oh, we're just so happy that y'all are here and we are also beyond happy. I don't know what's beyond happy for us that we're bringing biking back. <laughs> uh, it's, it is a, it is one of the best things that we do at Great River, as I say to not only my students, but also to my friends and anybody who will ask me what I do for a living. I say, well, let me tell you about biking with hundreds of kids because this year it is hundreds hundreds of kids and the th then why we do it. So let's bring biking back. These are pictures from previous biking trips and bike prep. And um, we're so looking forward to capturing your students in photos as well. Um, here's an overview of what we're looking at, the purpose of the bike trip, an overview of the route. We're gonna hear from Scott about that. Um, for sure, a typical day, what our safety and expectations are about on the trip. Uh, we'll probably hear a little bit from Brent about that as well. How we uh, support health and wellness, especially with medications, but actually more especially with food and water. And looking at, um, for your preparation, some packing list kinds of things, and also talking about the all important bike and other equipment and preparing for the bike trip. Feel free to put your questions in the Q&A. Tammy will be monitoring that. 
uh, during this webinar. And um, we will either take all of your questions at the end or um, Tammy will let me know if we need to take a question as we're going through. Right, Tam? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the purpose of the bike trip. It is a key experience, a physical challenge that unites the community and valorizes the student, leading to self-efficacy. Uh, we have seen this happen again and again on the bike trip, that students are coming together for the support of the whole group and also really figuring out who they are as an individual and what they can contribute. That's what we mean by valorize and self-efficacy. Every year I take a picture like this and I tell my students, I'm going to show this to you again when you graduate. We are, we are blessed with uh, not just a history of doing it at our own school, but it's a 30 year history of bike trips happening in adolescent Montessori programs uh, brought to us by the founders of our school. Uh, with along with their mission to create an adolescent program based on the needs of an adolescent. Um, some of you might not know that Great River was started as an adolescent program to fill those needs. It's a trip that fosters positive interdependence. Everybody has something unique to contribute to the good of the whole group. Students are cooking meals, they're fixing up bikes, they're setting up camp, they're taking care of each other, they're, in, they're starting games, they are, um, everybody is contributing and safety is our number one priority. This is a challenging trip physically and it can also be a challenging trip mentally and everything that we do, everything that we construct is about individual safety and group safety, both physically and mentally. Hey, Scott, do you wanna talk about our routes? Yes, yeah, Sarah, I'd love to. Um, I love this route. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Um, like Sarah mentioned, I look forward to bike trip every year and especially now since um, past few years of COVID. Um, it's a really special trip. It's unique, um, bringing in the ninth grade students and um, some more great faculty and uh, welcoming back some alumni um, to take part in this trip as well. Um, this is a route we've done, in my experience, which this is my 10th year at Great River. Um, so I think I've done eight bike trips. Um, and I've done this one several times. Um, it's really a straight, kind of a straightforward shot um, from um, Reedsburg to, um, is it Perot State Park, I think, Brent? Mm -hmm. um, and it's largely, I'd say 90% plus all on bike trail. Um, we'll be going on three main trails, the Elroy Sparta Trail, the Great River Trail, not sure how that all worked out, but <laughs> it's pretty, kind of special. The kids are like, what? This is the Great River Trail? Um, and then the 400 Trail as well. And those all link up to put us at about 100 miles over um, four days of biking and um, five, five days trip overall with uh, the commute, the driving, and whatnot. So um, two trips, one route. You can see it says up there, we'll have one group go um, northbound, one group go southbound, um, and they'll have staggered, staggered departures just to make it a little less hectic, more of a smoother uh, send off and return for everyone. So it's um, group one will be going, I guess, east to west, north, north to south, depending on how you look at the map. Um, Reedsburg to Pro State Park. Each of these days are, um, we like to shoot for about 25 miles a day. And it ends up being give or take a few miles depending on our, our campsites and whatnot. Um, this trail, like I said, it's about 90% on bike trail 
and that's either paved trail or um, crushed limestone which if you've ever biked on crushed limestone it's essentially it's like biking on a, a bike path really compacted and flat um, not too many hills there are other routes in the past that are a little more hilly this one's um, mostly flat maybe some low grade hills um, <laughs> and you know since it is a really popular trail there are um, you know, bathroom stops, picnic shelters along the way. Uh, we're near um, larger cities. If we, you know, happen to to need a uh, medical care, um, is nearby, and we have a relationship with the campgrounds from years past as well. So um, we like this route. Um, let's see. Um, along the way, students will you know get a chance to be at some state parks in Wisconsin State Parks, um, some smaller campgrounds, and you can see the prominent on the map there, the, the village of Norwalk, the black squirrel capital of the world. I don't, I'm not sure. Um, America. America, that probably. Yeah. Um, and that, I remember that, that's right, we come out of one of these tunnels. Um, some unique features about the trail, you go through these long tunnels. We actually don't bike through the tunnels. We have to walk our bikes because it gets dark. It's kind of an exciting and unique aspect of the trail. Um, it's like dark and cold. So like we, stu we ask students, hey, get your headlamps on and you might want a sweatshirt or a raincoat. Um, and we walk our bikes through the tunnel and emerge, you know, into um, the greenery of the, you know, Wisconsin um, the woods and some um, nice nature, uh, natural spaces. Um, what else do I want to say about the route? Um, we usually just kind of, as we're biking, what we like to shoot for is um, about taking water breaks every, I'd say, 25, 30 minutes or about every five miles, um, give or take um, miles or minutes, depending on your group. Um, students will self-select which group they ride in based on their um, either ability or maybe they how much they want to challenge themselves or maybe if they have some friends um, they'd like to ride with for that day. Um, that's about all I'll say about the route. Um, if there's any further questions, you know, we can field them in the Q&A session. So thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Scott. I know that you love this route well and that you know it well. And um, my first bike trip was this route. And um, it is, it's a classic. It's a real classic. Uh, a typical day on the trip. Um, these times might vary depending on what the community needs. But we have breakfast crew waking up at 630 uh, to start cooking to get us filled with good food to start off our day, our fuel, if you will. Uh, everybody is up at 7 a.m. and they take down the tents and we'll be training all of our students in how to do this. We've already started training about tents and other bike trip things. Then we pack our lunches. A lot of you have been asking about like, what do you need to be able to pack your food in? It's sandwich and chips and pickles. That's what I'm gonna tell you. Some fruit too. So you need to be able to have, you know, some sort of mess kit that can handle that to because we ask our students to travel with their lunch but then we have hot breakfast and hot dinner so for those things you're gonna want like a bowl and a plate and some utensils to eat that with um by 8 45 we're choosing our groups we've got generally speaking four groups that are biking group one group two group three and leisurely we just have to get there leisurely <laughs> Uh, we buy, we check all of our bikes for safety to make sure that they were ready to get on the road. We've got lots of bike mechanics with us and also trained students as bike mechanics. By 9.15 is our goal. The first group is leaving and then we stagger our leaving as we go along. Every group has at least three adults in it, if not more. There's a point and a sweep. So a point at the front and a sweep at the back and then floats that are in the middle um floating sometimes literally they feel like they're floating on their bikes 
<laughs> biking back and forth, uh, checking in on kids. We aim for a lunch around 11 or 12. Sometimes that's with another group. Sometimes it's not. Depends on speed and pacing. And then you can really see there's a staggered arrival at our campsite between one and five. Uh, the first group is generally the group that wants to bike faster. And so they get there first, which is awesome. They help set up the site. And we uh, then I, it's unbelievable to me how students after biking 30 miles still want to play. But they do. So we have some supervised recreation there. And we have some ninth graders that are designing group uh, games to play, both with balls and equipment and without. Uh, by 4.30, the dinner crew is reporting, and we have a huge, we feed a lot. We eat a lot on this trip. Dinner, um, and we have lots of different options, so I'm going to talk about that later. And a cleanup crew, we end with an evening community meeting, and then we get into our bed bedtime routine, nighttime medications. There's also morning medications. We're putting people in tents, and by 9.30, it's lights out. Now, I've been hearing some students say that they go to bed later, but I can tell you, your child will fall asleep at 9.35 after biking 30 miles. Some of this varies depending on what needs. You know, like, it's uh, the needs of the community might be that we need to have a community meeting along the way. Sometimes the weather presents us with a challenge. Um, and, and we deal with that because we don't bike when it's lightning and we don't bike when it's dangerous. But we do bike in the rain. We do bike in the rain. And you'll see that on the packing list. So safety and expectations. Oh, look at that campsite. That's one of the campsites we're staying at, right? Brent and Scott. Yeah, I love this place. Um, we have... We have lots of training to do about how to bike in groups. So we follow the legal rules of biking in a road. Um, and what that means, we follow those rules on trail and on roads. Even though we're on the trail most of the time, we follow the same rules on the trail. That includes learning how to use stop signs appropriately, learning how to use traffic lights, learning how to use communication back and forth, um, being mindful of your surroundings. Some of you maybe think that adolescents don't know how to be around other surroundings, and the bike trip teaches a lot of that. All of our faculty are first aid trained, wilderness first aid trained, or EMT. We've had professional EMTs, nurses, and doctors be with us on the trail as well. In our group, we have a point at the very front who um, is really in charge of the whole group. And she is the person who knows the route, knows where all of the like sticky wicked part parts are, met, pay, sets the pace for the group so that it's a safe pace, makes the decisions to stop along the way. And she's in constant communication with the sweep, who is the person at the back, who carries extensive first aid supplies and bike repair tools and has bike repair expertise. So that person is in the back always to sort of like catch up to people. Um, we also have support vans that the point is in communication with. Uh, the support vans meet us at various locations to provide us with water, granola bars, beef jerky, lemon drops, love, <laughs> support, maybe some rock and music to get us back on the bikes again because we're a little sore. Uh, and we know where they're going to meet us, and we're also communicating with them. And we're also watching the weather. All of the guides, but particularly the trip leads, are keeping track of radar and other weather resources so that we know if we need to seek shelter, how we're going to do that. We're also all trained in how to look for students who have maybe fallen behind. With a point in the front and a sweep in the back, we've got our students contained. Um, but one of the things that we do as a point is every time I stop, for example, I count every kid. The sweep actually comes up. I stop. The sweep comes up counting. <laughs> Reports to me how many there are. We do a high five because we have all of our children. We check in with each of them, drink some water, and then we get back on the trail. 
We also have safety with our materials because we have not only trained adults, professional bike mechanics, and also our bike shop extraordinaire Johnny Wakefield with us. Uh, we also have students who are trained to repair bikes. Right now we've got ninth graders that are learning about how to do bike repairs on the road, uh, specifically burst tires and brake adjustments. Those are the most two, the two common things. And I looked in on them today and they were learning how to do it without a post to hold the bike up because you don't have a post to hold the bike up when you're on the road. So they're like on the ground fixing bikes. It was pretty awesome. And we have safety in our environment. Every time I come to a stop where we're getting off our bikes for a little bit longer, like lunch or a longer break if it's needed, we set the boundaries. We have structured and unstructured time, um, but it's always supervised. Students um, and guides, we've been working on our trust this whole year um, so that we know and they know that they can trust us to keep them safe and we can trust them to be safe. I'm going to ask Tammy right now if there's any questions that we should address now before moving on. Um, I can run through a couple quick ones that are in there. Um, one question is, can riders wear headphones so they can listen to their music? Nope. Hard no. Um, students cannot bring in sleep in a hammock. We sleep in tents. And this year we have three students in a tent and those tent groups remain the same throughout the trip. Usually we mix them up every night, but with COVID precautions, we're not doing that. And we'll talk more about that. Um, and someone says, how can you keep the fast kids from taking off yet still allow them to be challenged? Sarah Scott, how can you keep the fast bikers from taking off yet still allow them to be challenged? Scott, that's a great question for you. Yeah. Yeah, good question. Um, well, like we talked about, students will self-select their groups. So if they want to go in a faster group, which are typically group one and two, um, we can't let the, the group decide the pace. And I've been part of like uh, groups that are like, they're all like, go, go, go. They want to go fast. And I mean, I like to ride fast. I can ride slow, but you know, I prefer riding fast. Um, and, you know, like Sarah mentioned, like checking in with the students, you can't, you know, like reading the group. Um, and if they're like, you know, pushing to want to go faster, then I can, you know, as the, the point or whoever the point may be, they can, you know, pick up the pace um, and, you know, check in and, and give the opportunities for students to kind of test their limits or see, um, you know, this is a time for adolescents like, you know, getting stronger, growing taller, um, you know, more engaged mentally with their body. Um, you know, it's a good time that they want to know um, how they can, you know, how fast they can go. Um, and we can, we'll push that a little bit, you know, we're not going to overdo it. And that's kind of like knowing your group. And um, so I think students will have the opportunity to do that. Um, and we, um, you know, we'll allow for that if they want to try group one one day. And in the past, you know, it's been a case where maybe a student was writing in like group three, which is, you know, a medium pace. And maybe they wanted to, like the next day they decide they want to, um, you know, push themselves a little bit more, maybe go to group one or group two. Um, and if they like that, if that was good for them, they can, you know, choose that for the, the third day. Or maybe they find out, wow, that was, you know, that was a little pushing a little too hard for me. Then they can drop back down to a group that will go at a, you know, a pace that's um, better for them. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Cool. Thanks, um, someone asks how we can know which group our student is in. And that's actually a tricky question this year. Um, we are really observing the students. Um, really looking to see like the right combination of students for each group. And um, we should be figuring that out in early May. If you've got a thing, feel free to send me an email. Um, but we're trying to make the best decisions for each and every single one of these 180-ish, 90-ish students. 200, 200, 200. 
turn. We're just going. 200. 200. Mm -hmm. um, students are not required to go on this trip. Usually they are, but because of COVID and all that is unseen and has passed, you are not required to go on this trip. Usually you are. Um, I'll let, there's a question about mountain bikes and different styles of bikes. And Sarah, I know we've got a slide on that. So we do. Yep. I'll let that um, come up. And then there were some in the chat. Uh, seven, eighth and ninth graders are working together in CAS in April and May. They've been working together in CAS and uh, we're hoping our ninth graders are stepping up a little bit, stepping up to the plate and reaching out doing that third year cycle of the three years in classes. So some of it is yet to be seen. Um, we're all reeling from and feeling the effects of the pandemic there. Um, let's see. Cool. I think we're good. Can the students not? Nope, the students cannot choose their 10th group. Sorry. Um, we do a really good job at mixing it up, making sure the students that need the right accommodation get those right accommodations. Um, our, I will just say our faculty is quite amazing in what they can do and how well they know the students. Um, students can fix or switch between the different bike groups each day. So Scott kind of mentioned a little bit, you bike in group one one day and then you're like, I'm sore. I'm going to drop back to group two. <laughs> you drop back, you come up. The only caveat we have there is sometimes behavior is such that we assign your biking groups. If you are, if your student is not able to handle the responsibility of biking and choosing where they want to bike, we choose it. And sometimes if that didn't work, they bike next to a guide and, um, I can just tell you, I'm real fun to bike next to all day. Uh, and then those freedoms in the afternoon get, you know, restricted a little bit. So that is one thing we'll talk about just a little bit. And I'll just, I'll just say it right now. That's, that's a, a big part of my job and Matt's job and David's job on the trip is to hold students accountable for their behavior. There isn't a lot of wiggle room for nonsense behaviors. Like Sarah said, safety is our primary concern. And if at any point the student is being unsafe, we can't trust them to keep others safe and to keep themselves safe. Oh, uh, <laughs> you'll likely hear from us. And that means if the behavior continues, you come and get your student, whether we're four hours away, six hours away or one. And, um, this, so this isn't a good time for caregivers to take a vacation because their student is gone. Your, we still may need you to come get your student if the behavior isn't um, acceptable. So we go over all of that with students before, yeah. during, before and during the trip. And um, usually before things are getting to that route, where you need to come and get them, you're hearing from us. Mm -hmm. um, there's always potential for something to go very wrong and you need to come and get the student immediately because something has happened, but. Um, Tammy, in the interest of time, I'm gonna yeah. say that we, um, I wanna go through some more slides here, um, but I will say that the language I've been using with my students is like, when you choose to engage in these behaviors that will make the group unsafe, then you're making the decision to have your parents come and pick you up. Yeah, your caregivers. Um, conversation. Yeah. And, and to that end, the adult to student ratio, we've got a, about 200 students coming and about 45 adults coming on the trip. Um, and the roads we're on is super low traffic when we're on roads and 90%, really 95% were rarely off the limestone trails. So um, super safe. We're not traveling along cars on this route, except to get off the trail two blocks to the campsite. So train our kids on how to do that. Yep. Uh, the slide that I have right, right now is our plan with our current COVID rates. As I've been saying to students, we don't know what our current COVID situation will be like in early June. 
we're constantly, not constantly, but regularly looking at their COVID rates and working with both administration and the pandemic advisory. Um, right now we're recommending some PCR tests three days prior for the, to the trip. That's based on the Minnesota Department of Health. And then we will be delivering rapid tests the morning of the trip to your students. Um, we're, we are assigning tense groups and we, this is probably unbelievably what we spend the most of our planning time on is figuring out those tense groups. Um, you're remaining with that tent group for the duration. We're asking people to bring masks for the bathrooms and busing. Um, we're busing to the first campsite and we're busing home from the day. And we're going to assign seats on the bus. So all of this is mindful of keeping people safe and healthy. Um, and healthy is such a big deal. Uh, we, I love this picture of this student exulting at making all of this garlic bread. <laughs> Uh, we cook our meals and they're full, big meals. Um, we have vegetarian, vegan, and gluten-free options. Uh, so many of our seventh and eighth years are being trained already and learning how to cook and prepare food. And we're doing that for some of our ninth years as well. We have snacks that you're gonna hear about later, uh, making healthy choices. It's all about fueling your body. Staying hydrated is two water bottles. I love Scott's thing. like drink a bottle to fuel your belly and then fill it up again so you have two of them um, at the beginning of every day uh, every time i stop it's about staying hydrated that's actually rule number two of the leisurely group and also dressing for success um, wearing layers of your clothing is really helpful um, i prefer to actually wear long sleeves on the bike trip because i prefer to sweat into material than anything else and I bring a lot of socks along. I bring a lot of extra socks so I can change my socks. And sturdy closed toe shoes. Your students might try to wiggle some other kinds of shoes around you, like those that are spelled with the initials Crocs. Crocs are not acceptable for biking. They don't stay on your feet. You need a shoe that's gonna stay on your foot, whether it's laced or has some sort of um, elastic situation that it stays on your feet we're biking 30 miles a day and just like we check for laces and loose material to be all tucked up so that it doesn't interfere with the bike we also expect that of our shoes as well other kinds of shoes like sandals and crocs are really welcome when we're at campsite to air out those tootsies oh and hey look at here is um uh a packing list. Um, I'm gonna just let you take a look at that. You might notice a lot of things about wool in here. Wool is a fiber, um, especially lightweight wool, that is really great for biking. It doesn't smell as bad. Um, also cotton stuff like fleeces and things like that, when it gets wet, it actually saps your warmth from you while wool holds warmth in you. We will bike in the rain, so waterproof raincoat and pants is actually a thing. Um, right now, we don't see a lot of rain on the forecast, but it's only March, so we don't know what it's actually going to look like in early June. June is the rainiest month in Wisconsin, so you can we can expect some rain. Um, Many of you um, in the initial question was asking about a mess kit. Again, that mess kit needs to be able to handle our hot food for breakfast, which can be oatmeal or eggs or some things like that. And for our dinners, which could be like spaghetti or chili or soup or other hearty things like that. But we also need something that can carry a sandwich and chips and fruit and pickles and pickles during the day. So it's a mess kit that has to accommodate all of that stuff. And Sarah, we do have um, like lunch containers for students and that'll show up on the sign up genius when um, we get a little bit closer. Um, but that is my pro tip is, I got two pro tips. One, rain gear is my most important thing. Uh, pants and coat, most important. Second is a three compartment 
a lunch container that has a top that closes because I like my pickles not to get my chips wet. And nobody likes a pickly sandwich. So um, I like a pickly sandwich though. Gross, I do another thing. <laughs> so um, those are those things. A couple other things that I, when I was looking over the survey, thanks to you that have filled that out. There's a link at the end if you haven't. Don't bring your own tent. We got that. We got it covered. We um, figure out tent groups based on like, you know, we're looking for the right combination, not the good friends, not the best friends, but not the like mortal enemies. Um, <laughs> those right combinations for tent groups and bus seats, stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of questions about a day pack. It could just be a backpack. Um, but I really like those panniers that go on the side of my bikes, but I'm kind of old. I'm feeling it at this point. So students, I would say 90% of the time are using backpacks mm -hmm. and just fine. So. Although I'll say uh, for our reading students, a backpack with one book in it is really nice for the day. Yeah. Pack. <laughs> Not a backpack with 10 books in it. Really cute. Yeah. Hey, and um, I just want to really want to reiterate, this is a tech free thing. The guides are on phones because we're keeping our people safe and we're communicating. We also have walkie talkies, but cell phones, iPods, music listening devices, no electronic devices are needed for this. It's a chance to hear the sounds of nature, to hear the sounds of laughter of each other, and to hear directions to keep our bodies safe. Um, all of the adults are contactable, and if you need to contact your student for some way, we have ways for you to do that. Um, we just, we really want to keep the student present in the moment. And we know that cell phones and iPods and other music devices, um, there, there might be exceptions with various uh, IEPs and 504s, and we are bringing our social workers and our special education guides with us. And so they will be dealing with those for those individual students, but generally speaking, it's not safe to listen to music when you're biking in a group. It's just not safe because you need to be responding to and aware of the whole group. Hmm. Uh, medications too, but there's going to be more about this and we're going to mail all of this out to you. Um, uh, so here's some stuff about bikes. If you're considering buying a new bike, um, a good used bike is better than a low quality new bike. That's just the plain truth of it. Department store bikes, and I'm talking here about like a Target, Walmart, or any sort of like non-primarily bike shop. Those bikes are usually cheaply made for one season of use. Those are not the bikes that we are looking forward to having. Road bikes are fine. Uh, Scott has done this trip on skinny tires a whole lot. I myself like my hybrid bike for my old lady body and I can sit upright with my cute little bike pretty helmet. This is a helmet. Mm -hmm. um, I also agree with Tammy. I like panniers and a rack. Also, I'm getting a new bike seat for my Muppet that's coming along. <laughs> backpack does work though, um, but a smaller backpack. You don't want it to be huge. It just needs to carry your lunch and your rain gear and your extra water bottle. Water bottle cages are super nice to have. Biking is always done with two hands on the handlebars. Um, the only time we allow one hand to leave is if you're getting water or if you're itching something on your nose right here and it's just really driving you crazy. But otherwise we're two hands on, on the wheels. And we also have a Great River School bike fleet. Um, and we got loaners there and, and people have been donating bikes and they're some pretty nice bikes of all different sizes. Um, there's more information about the kind of bike that you need in the survey, which is tagged at the end if you haven't filled that out. Brent, I'm hoping that you are coming. Oh, no, not yet. <laughs> I'm looking for your slide, Brent. I can't remember which one it is. Uh, bike tune-ups. You can totally schedule a bike tune-up at your local bike shop. And I know that many of us have our local bike shop that really like. We just want to make sure that your bike is tuned up so you should submit your receipt to us. Or you can schedule your bike tune-up at Great River. 
A bike tune-up typically these days is costing about a hundred bucks for a basic one, maybe more. And we're going about half of that at the righty tidy. See what they did there? Righty tidy, righty tidy. <laughs> Uh, student mechanics tune up all of the bikes under the watchful eyes of our bike shop guide, Johnny Wakefield, and professional support mechanics. We'll send you a link about that um, and so that we can schedule it in. So it's a great way to give our students expertise so that they feel confident about fixing bikes on the road and um, also a chance to uh, support financially the trip because all of the money that goes into that bike tune up um, after parts. Um, actually it's most of the money because we have a lot of the tune up things. You don't need extra parts. So that money goes to supporting the bike trip. The most common roadside repair is a flat tire. When you're on the road, now my daddy taught me how to repair with patches, but when you're on the road, it's going to be a spare tube. That's the fastest way to get a kid back on a bike biking. So we're going to ask that, um, you send along two uh, spare tubes along with your students so that we can easily swap them out on the road. We can patch at the camp, but to get us back uh, going, we're gonna have spare tubes that we carry in the day bag. Hey Brent, do you maybe wanna talk about medications and stuff as our, is that something you can speak knowledgeably about? Pretty sure. Sure. Thanks. So. Medications, uh, I mean, I'm just kind of comparing it to how we did it with uh, our key experience. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so know that we are only allowed to give any kinds of medications, whether it's prescription or non-prescription, um, if you fill out the form. But also, a provider has to sign off on these forms. So we have one for prescription, one for non-prescription that will get either emailed or sent home, I'm sure, at some point. Um, typically there's a list of non-prescription medications that we'll have handy. Uh, if you have other things, um, on the key experience, melatonin was very popular among families to bring in for their kids. Um, so even things like, uh, I guess basically anything can, needs to have be included on that form. So that was the biggest hurdle, I think, for a lot of families, just figuring out how to do that, um, you know, just emailing that to your provider and they can sign off and fax it to school or email back to you, whatever they need to do. Um, it didn't necessarily require a visit to, you know, an actual wellness visit. So um, they're not to carry any of their own meds. We will do that as the adults on the trip. We will, um, you know, as they get turned in, we'll make schedules and keep track of every individual student. Um, every time we give a med, we'll be checking it. Okay. Got this at breakfast, got this at lunch, got this at dinner. Um, so that helps us stay organized and help all your students stay healthy and safe. So, um, you know, big thing might be allergies at that time. So just being sure if you think that will be an issue to uh, start early to get those forms turned in. It's really, really hard when things get turned in on the last couple of days. Uh, just for number one, organization reasons, and uh, number two, lots of other things are happening at that same time. So that's usually why we have a deadline, which will be coming eventually. I know we're still a ways out, but it's um, June first. June first. There you go. <laughs> so those those are the two forms, and the non-prescription form kind of has the things that we will have with us. So anything else that's uh, non-prescription over the counter. Uh, you would have to provide that along with this sign document by yourself and the provider. So both people need to sign them or we cannot distribute anything. And this, this also means if your student falls and needs ibuprofen or has a headache and needs ibuprofen, even if you didn't send it, we can't give it to them unless we have this form. And then we have to call you and get your verbal permission. And that means that you then have to pick up a random phone number, phone call um, in the, the middle of the night or the middle of the day. So that gets really hard and it just cuts out you 
if you can get this form filled out and gets your kid, your student, the, the treatment that they need quicker. So it is a little bit of a hassle because they both need doctor's uh, signatures uh, because we're not doctors. I'm a teacher. Uh, <laughs> so um, that is why all of the formality. So like Brent said, send that in right now and get that back to us as soon as you can. And you can just email it to office at. Um, cool. And I will also, as I've been saying to students already, because they ask me a lot of questions about this, if there are medications that your student needs to carry on their bodies because of the kind of medication it is, then we'll do that on a case by case basis. Yep. But I still want to know when they take it. Yep. And when it comes to my bottom line of this, and I know that your parents and you understand this, if something bad happens, I need to be able to say to the medical personnel, this is what is in this student's body. Yep. That is like a real strong line for me that I need to know so that I can tell other people what they've already taken. So I know that many of you have been in those situations where you had to say they've taken this and this and this medication already. So that's important information for us to know, even though many of our, especially ninth graders are really good about taking the kind of medications that they need to take. We know that they're responsible about it, but I need to know so that I can tell somebody else if that happens. It's not gonna happen, but if it does, I'm ready. So let's review all of this, so much this information. We still have some more and I'm looking at the time again. I think we're doing okay. Um, there's a lot of things in here about dates. Again, we're gonna send this out to you. Um, it's about the purpose. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the bar jerky drive, um, the packing list, the safety procedures. I'm also gonna talk a little bit later about what we're gonna do to prepare you. Um, is this a good time for questions, Tammy, or do you want me to move on from this? Um, you know, I, we're answering questions uh, in the chat. There's one about the forms. If nothing has changed and you turn it in in the fall, that sounds great. It is still accurate and just fine. But you all know if you've got something that changed, um, tent groups, this is also, it, it is um, similar. Students are really worried about tent groups and maybe families are too. Um, we'll pick them. We will help make sure that they are safe and secure and fun and they're mixed age groups. So um, we're really trying, the purpose of the trip is to build community, build self-confidence and um, uh, really have fun. So that having fun part isn't like have the best time of your life because <laughs> those that's kind of chaotic sometimes. So um, <laughs> we you all know. know. Somebody, somebody, a student asked me if I could guarantee that they were going to have a friend in their tent group. And I said, I can't guarantee that, but I can guarantee you that you have a potential friend in your tent group, which is maybe the schlockiest thing I've ever said. I don't know what I mean, but well I or um I just I mean I'm a summer camp counselor for 30 years it's yeah. <laughs> like it, it's pretty hmm. um but we do care about safety we have uh three different kinds of tents that we're looking at male identifying female identifying and non-binary and I've had some students ask me about those two and again I will say we spend the most time on tent groups. Yeah. The most time leading up. We Sarah, are watching and watching all of these things. It says, um, bring money. What are we bringing money for, Sarah? Oh my God. Some, you know what? I've been working with a root and rules group and we've been looking at the root and finding out when we can like stop to buy snacks. Like where are the speedways? They're very mm -hmm. focused on speedways. It's super funny. Where is there a Dairy Queen? Hmm. Uh, I do believe at Norwalk, there's a lovely little ice cream hot dog mm -hmm. stand. So sometimes we do have the opportunity to make a stop and get some frozen confectionery treats. We should add that to the map, probably. Very important. Uh, <laughs> uh, Brent, 
I have been adding those to the map. Okay, as good. We've been doing. We also know where all <laughs> the large stuffed animal signs are, and interesting um, nature things. Mm -hmm. So that's what that money is about. That um, sometimes we stop, and the only thing that will satisfy me and my children is a artificially colored sugared piece of ice in a plastic tube. <laughs> I'm down for that party. Um, and there's a question about the dress code regarding swimsuits. We're just we're just not going to answer that one right now. And um, I'm going to take that to our leadership team and really, you know, we have a dress code that says no belly buttons. And we're I don't know if you've seen teenagers lately. Um, <laughs> we have bigger fish to fry. So I'm going to take it to our leadership team and. <laughs> see where we're at there um what we're interested in right now is that we don't want and we're also really aware of the availability of what kind of clothing there is actually available for adolescents to buy and we we don't uh there are some uh there is a pool at one of our campsites and so there is a swimming option and we certainly don't want people to have to go buy a different swimsuit for that so we are working on it and we know that students are concerned about it also, we know that students are worried about being ready for the trip. And something that our school does, which I'm super proud of, is that we prepare our students. Um, we have biking casts. That's on Wednesday afternoons. On every single Wednesday in April and May, we will be biking. Um, um, more information on the next slide about that. And then the th now three days leading up to the bike trip, which is a week, three days is a week. We will make sure that every student goes on a half day bike ride and every student goes on two full day bike rides. Um, so we'll be practicing. We're building up that stamina. It is incredible to see how our students bodies like get used to biking in April and May and then that prep week, they're biking more and more and more and they get so strong. It's so cool. Biking with your family and friends also helps. So for families who are able to go on bike rides on Saturdays and Sundays um, or walking, walking is like one of the best ways to build endurance for biking. Running's not, running uses like different muscles, but walking and doing walks for things, parking further away at shopping excursions or at other events, all of those things help to build endurance. But we will like look at these kids by lined up here on I think they're at the U they're on the Dinky Town, aren't they? Yep. Yeah. 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 That's a great route for our Dinky Town Greenway. Right. Yep. Looks like. So we'll be doing biking castes in April and in May. And we're doing it by advisory. These are not the trip groups. These are the biking cast groups. Um, we're doing it by advisory because that's so easy to communicate to families about when you need to have a bike and a bike lock and a water bottle and rain gear and proper attire. Uh, usually families drop, drop off bikes in the morning and pick up in the afternoon. Some enterprising kids like to bike to school on biking Wednesdays just to add a little bit more oomph. I know that I do. Um, I'm biking two days a week this week. Next week is three days. In April, I'll start biking four days a week. All of that helps me build up my endurance. So you can see there the advisories that are biking in April. Michael, Scott, Laura, Emily B, Libby, and Sarah. That's me. Did I request my advisory to go first? I think I did. <laughs> and then uh, in May, it will be the rest of the advisories. Johnny, Emily, H, Tracy, Chad, Elena, and Patricia. Car oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Carpools are really helpful. If you can, um, if you have like car capability to haul two or maybe even three or four bikes, um, that does actually really help. We don't keep bikes overnight on our site. It's not, it's not safe. It's not something that we can, um, protect and take care of. So if your kid is not biking to school on Wednesdays, um, then you'll need to arrive, do some trip off. We will be storing bikes at school during our bike trip prep week. 
because it's 200 breaks, my friends. Yeah. Uh, if you have any need equipment, have concerns or questions, you can fill out this survey. This survey is the primary way for you to communicate with us, your students' needs, your students' ability level, and your concerns. I personally am looking at the results from this survey two or three times a day and forwarding off different questions to different people with different expertise. Um, I'm seeing a lot of there about like, I'm worried about stamina. We are too. That's why we're biking in April and May and then for another week. I see some of you are expressing concerns about like, what does a mess cat actually mean? I'm like, yeah, that's fair. We haven't been camping in three years. You don't know what that's like. So we're responding to those as we can. Um, Tammy knows that I'm spending a lot of think my thinking time, and I know Scott and Brent is as well on bike trip. So we are thinking about your concerns, and we're processing them and responding them to them as we can. There is an International Bike to School Day. It is on Wednesday, May 4th. Family, adults, and adolescent students are organizing this. There will be more information coming from our community volunteers, so pay attention to this. This is school-wide, where we have first through 12th graders biking to school on this day, and we like arrange different stations where people can meet up and bike together. It's pretty awesome. When St. Paul folks were witnessing our site to talk about different concerns, they came on a walk and bike to school day, and they were so impressed how many kids biked that day like from a city of St. Paul perspective. There are many ways that you can help in volunteering. Um, two ways is, uh, uh, one way is doing trip return day support. That's um, being there and ready to like take up gear and clean the gear at home and bring back to school. That's like our lunch containers and other food things and all of our cooking equipment and tents and tents and tents like to dry <laughs> them out and brush them out tarps tarps and tarps uh, we will have some students doing this as well but it's really helpful for our families to do it for us because we're a little tired mm. or i'm a math teacher let's just think about this here one granola bar i hope i did this math right actually because i did it really quickly one granola bar per student per day means 800 bars minimum and Tammy I eat like five granola bars a day on the bike trip not just one it's super funny because by the fourth day kids are like no I'm good I don't want any more granola bars I right? only eat granola bars yeah. on the bike trip Ugh. people give them to me the rest of the year I'm like mm -mm. Mm -mm. but the jerky <laughs> is really uh, like our meat eating students really love that um, we have other things. We have fruit and we have other protein sources that we're giving. Um, I'm a big fan of pickles, as you know, and drinking pickle juice along the way. I'm salivating just thinking of it. But we will have a bar and jerky drive. It's amazing how kids swarm in. And we love the gluten-free ones and the other fruit. Like, we we have them all separated out in the vans. It's, it's really vital because we're fueling our bodies, fueling our bodies to do this. Oh. I had a one more volunteer possibility yeah. that Brent, thank you. Tell me. Yeah. Um, well, our bikes are going to be in U-Haul trucks and the trucks will probably need to be returned here after we drop them off. And for a staff person to do that, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, if we can, I still have to double check our insurance since we're paying for the truck. Yeah. Can parent volunteers drive it, but. So you're talking about so, like, a parent volunteer driving our truck that has all the bikes in it to the bike drop off site. To the, yes. And then, and then just returning the truck afterwards. The truck. Yeah. It'll be a 26 footer. So. Ooh. And then we've got. Um, Two actually. Each day. Yeah. We've got like the day before the days before we leave. Students are doing a lot of the work packing the U hauls and the vans and the food containers. And they just need a lot of adult support. So we we definitely need uh, family and caregiver volunteers those days. We like to try and keep um, 
family and caregivers off of the bike trip um, and really let the student grow maybe more now than ever into their adolescenthood on these trips with free of their parents and then return them safely back to their caregivers. Um, transform. So they're transformed. transformed. Thousands of opportunities to help, maybe 800 granola bars, but um, really this trip cannot happen without um, family and caregiver support. So um, I think it is one of the formative transforming trips that when your student comes home, you'll be like, that was incredible. I know my first bike trip uh, was incredible. Um, so as an adult, um, <laughs> so I think the more you can do to help us, the less, uh, stress will be and the more present and ready to go, we will be. So we, I can't just, I really can't stress that enough. We appreciate every bit of help we get from families, every single bit. So no, um, help is too small or too great. So um, I'll be working with our parent engagement group, PEG, to um, make sure we have a really robust sign up genius document and send that out to you. So um, let's see some questions. Do, 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 do. What will happen if an injury occurs on the trip? We've had everything from little tiny scrapes to broken femurs. And usually they don't get hurt on the bikes. Um, <laughs> Sarah true. and I were just talking about that today. Um, <laughs> it's so true. And we've got wilderness first aid people. Uh, we usually have doctors or pediatric nurses there to help us out. And we're this trip, we're close to ambulance and um, hospitals. We have all of the um, major hospitals and minor hospitals yep. marked on our maps along the way, and we have all of their contact information. Um, yeah. yeah. One of the questions is, will there be a daily end of day updates? And I used to say, yes, I used to commit to like a hundred percent. I will do that. And then it would be like midnight in the tent. And I'm exhausted with like a bar of service trying to send something. And then it dawned on me like, uh, may, maybe if your guides have uh, ability to send that out and we have service and I have really good service and I sometimes don't have service out there. So um, what this trip focuses oh, on- Can I add something to that, Tammy? Yeah. If, you, if we don't send out an update, it's because we're paying attention to your students. Yeah, that's, yeah, really that's what it is. I, I was going to say that this trip focuses on the development of your student, really going from childhood to adolescent. And uh, I don't want to take away that lovely ride home from the school where you're trying to keep yeah. them awake yeah, and trying to get anything from them. It's a lovely moment. Mm. Tell us about it, the bike trip. I just want to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and that isn't something we haven't talked about um is that when your student gets home we'll remind you of this at like when they get off the bus one of us will be the first ones off to be like remember your student is exhausted they've done something that is very hard might be the hardest thing they've ever done and they might just want to sleep i know i know i like crawl into a dark little hole in that couch over there in my basement and um, Scott taught me this trick a long time ago. Just watch movies and eat a pizza. <laughs> so um, we, <laughs> uh, we're, that might be what your student is. And my eight-year-old, when she goes on the bike trip, will talk for hours constantly. So it really is just dependent on your student. And we're, we're taking their lead. We're following their lead. And... Man, it was also hard when our students don't tell us anything about the trip. So it'll come out. We'll have lots of updates later. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll have that slideshow that we show on the last day of school. Yeah. We'll send that to you. And what I do really appreciate is there's, I think, at least three people in the chat that are like, I have a bike rack I can loan, um, things like that. That's amazing. So, um, 
maybe I'll save the chat and then we can connect with our parent engagement group and be networking and things like that. And if you need support, you need help, we're here to help. We're here to make this trip possible for each and every student. And there's all sorts of different abilities and uh, there are showers available on the trip, not every single night, um, but yeah, there's showers available on the trip. So I think we've gotten all the questions and I mean, we've kept it to an hour and six minutes, which is pretty darn good for these tips. Also, Tammy, can't people send you their questions? Mm -hmm. And they can also put them into the link for the survey, the readiness survey. Yeah, that survey is the place to put those questions. Um, and <laughs> a student said today was like, I can never find you. Where are you in the building, Tammy? And I was like, you'll never know. It could be anywhere. If you send me questions and you fill out the survey within the next two days while we're at conferences, you increase the likelihood that I have the ability during the day to email you back or Sarah does. Um, so um, I'll put a little plug in to fill out that survey as soon as you can. Scott. Can I, did, yeah, just also gonna say, um, since conferences are happening to, uh, tomorrow and the next day, um, this is the conference where your advisor will probably be checking in with, you know, you and your student um, about bike trip. You know, we'll have a few minutes to say, you know, hey, you have any questions that maybe your advisor could field right there. Um, if, if your advisor can't answer, they can always pass it on to Tammy, Sarah, Brent, Johnny, um, one of uh, your other guides that could um, answer that questions and follow up with you probably within, I'd say, the next um, the next school day or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I think the survey is also gonna be available if, if you don't get a chance to do that before um, end of the week at conferences, we'll have um, opportunities for you to, to do that. I just put it into the chat. Great. Yeah. If anybody wanted to link on it right now. Yeah. I just want to, uh, as we're wrapping things up, right, Tammy? Yeah. I just want to revisit what I said at the beginning, which is I think this is one of, if not the best thing that our school does for our students. It is a tremendous experience to see our students grow uh, at, uh, five feet <laughs> tall when they are responsible and taking responsibility for their own bodies and for other people's bodies and it's really amazing it is also the most frequent thing that is mentioned by our graduates when they're talking at the microphone they talk about the odyssey and they talk about the bike trip and and so it's that there's a bit of a long game um when they talk about it but i see our students coming back and now we have upper adolescent students that are also biking with us in biking cast and they're doing it because they're recognizing how much of an experience it was for them it's really important um and then to my non-teacher friends when i'm talking to them about it they're just like this is just an amazing thing confidence on the road feeling safe in your environment out in the field it's the best. And it's so fun. Yeah. It's so fun, even for guides, right? It is so fun. It's very hard work and we're exhausted. Students are exhausted. It is so fun. Oh, Thank ridiculous. you for giving us your children to do this with. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. So I am grateful for you all here and giving us feedback. Those of you that filled out that survey, that gave us a ton of like feedback on what you needed to hear. And students have been giving us feedback for like a month. So that's really, really helpful. Um, and grateful for you to be here and hear this chat or listening to an hour and a half, maybe on fast forward in um, the recorded version. So <laughs> cool, Thanks, cool. Chris. Without further ado, we appreciate your support and partnership at home and guides. Thanks for giving up an hour of your 
Wednesday evening. Always. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Tammy. Bye, right, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Looking forward Bye. to it. Bye. Bye. Oh, the gratitude, Tammy, the gratitude. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Always fills your cup, right? It God. really does. Love tank, love tank, I think is what. Oh, yeah, that's what it is. Love the, the love tank. Cool. Bye, y'all. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night. <laughs>